see because I loved how welcoming everyone was and how everyone wanted to get to know me and make me feel like a part of the family, even from the very first day. When I came to church, it was more of an open arms type people. Everyone always say they're greeting people, they always love people, but when I came here, this is the actual church to actually do. I feel loved, I feel praised. I love that there is a strong presence of Jesus in this church. There's always life-giving people around me and encouragement and just the presence of the Spirit all over. It's a really creative community. It's a wonderful place to be. To me, this church um, is a place where I can really feel the Holy Spirit um, in anything I do. One thing I love is being able to be a, a part of this creative team here at the church and working with others um, and telling a story of what God's doing in everyone's life. I love how involved the church is with the community itself. It's really cool seeing how much um, the church does even behind the scenes. I love the diversity of the congregation. Um, lots of people from young to old and all different cultures and backgrounds and that's something that was important to us. I love being here because I get to build relationship with teenagers. Oh my goodness, and what a better way to invest in the future to than to invest in teenagers' lives. It is a safe, fun, and relevant place where all kinds of people come to heal and grow into the people that God made us to be. Because I get to learn about Jesus. <laughs> is this home for us? Yes. I just feel love. What can I say? Well, good morning, Vineyard. Welcome back on this Sunday morning. If you don't know me, my name is Cody Barton. I'm the worship pastor here at Vineyard in Overland Park, and we're going to spend some time in worship together this morning. Um, this week, I wanted to continue celebrating what Jesus did on the cross. And so as we sing this morning, we're just going to celebrate who he is and the freedom that he's brought us. And so um, I'm going to pray for us as we get started, and I want you to sing along with us. Um, so, or stand or kneel, just worship in freedom wherever you are, however you can this morning. But we are going to bring this before the Lord. So God, I thank you so much uh, for your son, Lord, and just the the bondages that he's come to, to break off of us, Lord. And so um, I thank you, Lord, that we get to encounter you um, because of Jesus, Lord. And I ask, Lord, this morning that you would just send your Holy Spirit into our homes. God, that you would meet us right where we are this morning amid circumstances or any, um, any, things, any of the things that are tugging at us and trying to steal the joy and peace that you have already said is your gift to us. So... Father, we love you, and we give this gift of worship to you this morning. Um, in Jesus' mighty name, amen. have run but oh how fears the love of God his life laid down a sacrifice for us the grave could never overcome we will rise we will rise and sing praise to the God who saved took on flesh and conquered sin and death. Glory, glory, glory. Sing to Jesus' glory to the one who saves us. Glory, glory, glory. Sing to Jesus. See 
is tied as to your heart and covers all that we are not. For we've been marked with love from the start, and by your spirit we belong. We will rise and sing praise to the God who saves. On flesh and conquered sin and death. Glory, glory, glory. Sing the Jesus glory to the one who saves us. Glory, glory, glory. Sing to Jesus. you this morning and we thank you for your son. God, we desperately need you. again.
with everything inside of me. I raise a hallelujah. Oh, I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah in the midst of all the mystery. I raise a God, we love you so much, and we thank you for your presence and for your joy. God, would you continue taking us deeper this morning into praise with you, into intimacy with you, God, that we would sense you near, Lord. 
Come, Lord Jesus. Guys, this is the new song that I'm going to introduce this morning by a friend, um, Annabeth Morgan. Um, she had a lot of help on this song. There's a few other authors on there, too. Um, it's just so good. So wherever you are, um, maybe this can be a song this week that you find. Um, I'm going to have posted it on Facebook by this time, so you can find it there as well. Um, God is so close to us, you guys. He's so close to us. He's so aware of the circumstances that you're facing right now um, and the frustrations that you have, and he can handle all of those things. Even when you're frustrated at him, he can handle that. Just like any good father, um, which he is. He's a good, good father. Where can I go from your presence? Where can I run from your spirit? You meet me there. Spirit, you meet me there. Where can I go from your presence? Where can I hide from your spirit? You find me there. Spirit, you find me there. From the highest highs to the lowest lows, from the mountain top to the valley below, you meet me here. Spirit. Spirit, you meet me there. Spirit, you meet me there. Where can I go from your presence? Where can I hide from your spirit? You find me there. Spirit, you find me Even there your light 
shines bright like the morning. You shine bright like the morning. And you meet me here. Spirit, you meet me here. Always embracing, never rejecting. You're kind. God, we thank you for the way um, the melodies soften our hearts, Lord, and that they also fight battles, that you renew our mind um, through your word, and that most of all, God, you meet us exactly where we are. This morning, Lord, would you speak to our hearts and bless Mark as he teaches, Lord. Would you open our hearts, God, exactly where we need you this morning and pour your grace and mercy right into those places. We bless you and we love you so very much, God. Thank you that we get to gather together in this way. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Hey, what's up everyone? Welcome to my home. I'm Ryan, I'm on staff here at VCC, and I'm so glad you're here with us watching online. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. We'd love to connect with you during the online service. So text us or message us here online. Our pastors are on hand to connect and respond to any questions you may have, and our prayer team is ready to pray with you at any moment in today's service. If you can, go ahead and click the connect card tab or click the link given to you in the comments so that we can know that you are here watching with us. Even though church looks a little different in these times, we still want to encourage you to go to church with the whole family. VCC Kids has some awesome resources you can use as a family, which you can find in the link in the comments and description below. Our youth group is meeting online, so parents, check out this resources link below. And students, don't forget to stay connected on IG at YouthVCC. If you're not currently in a small group and in need of community, I'd love to invite you to our midweek group, The Gathering, where you can connect, meet people, and grow in your walk with God all through an online Zoom call. Don't forget, you can stay up to date at vcc.church, 
through social media at Vineyard Overland Park, and also by downloading our VCC app, which has everything that you need to stay involved in our church community. Even in these uncertain times, we as a church are taking the whole month of April to walk through the spiritual practice of celebration. Good news is celebrating God doesn't depend on perfect circumstances or happy feelings. Even in prison, Paul and Silas found something to sing about. And so we can't think of a better way to push back against the frustration, fear, and despair that enemy is trying to sow into so many hearts than to celebrate God together. Also, I want to invite you to send in a video or photo of how you are celebrating God in this time. You can send the video to my story at vcc.church or share it with us on social media by using the hashtag VCCCelebrate. We'd love to create a video at the end of the month sharing how everyone is celebrating God in these times. Okay, let me pray over the offering which you can give through our online giving. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, thank you so much for how you are always providing and constantly taking care of us especially in this season. We thank you, Lord, that you are ahead of us, over us, around us, surrounding us, and with us every day. We bless this offering in your name. Amen. Good morning, Vineyard family. I want to welcome every one of you, whether you're a regular part of the family, or you're joining us today for the very first time. Grace and peace to you wherever you are this morning. Boy, these are strange times. Everything feels surreal and out of sorts. It's a bit off center, higgledy piggledy. And yes, I still like interesting words. I mean, things are not what they were. And it's only natural to begin to wonder if things will ever be the same again. Some are concerned for loved ones who are especially at risk, and rightly so. Others are wondering if they'll have a job when this is all over or if their company will even survive. Some have experienced the loss of income. Others are trying to juggle work responsibilities with children who are suddenly at home and underfoot. I mean, these are strange times and there are a host of new pressures and challenges added to the pressures of everyday life. So as a result, we're all forced to adapt to what's becoming a new normal while mourning the loss of so many things, big and small, things we might have taken for granted. By now, the novelty of multiple Zoom calls, work from home, shop from home, school from home, and church from home may have you dreaming of a home away from home. I know for me, I'm beginning to wonder what it would be like to work from work again. Uh, it, It may seem like a small thing, given the circumstances, but I really miss being together on Sunday morning. When we're together, you're always provoking me and teasing me and forcing me to preach longer sermons. I really miss that. I mean, I miss the interruptions, the spontaneous reactions, the contagious laughter and the collective eye rolls. I miss worshiping with you, praying with you, laughing with you. But most of all, I miss being with you. In times like these, We want to remain present, in the present, with the ever-present one. But the mounting pressure of our changing circumstances, the uncertainty of the future, the disappointment over what's been lost, these things can crowd our thoughts in a crisis, robbing the present of the peace that God is only too ready to provide. So what can we do about it? How do we stay centered on God when nothing is as it should be? I want to begin a new series today from the book of Daniel entitled, What to Do When All Seems Lost. But before I do, I want to light this candle to remind us once again that God is with us now and always, and the Holy Spirit is our teacher. You might want to take a moment to light a candle at home to remind you that God is here and we are with him. Let's bow together for prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come into your presence with expectation, with a desire, Father, to hear from you today. Once again, Lord, all that we are, just as we are, we surrender our lives to you and we entrust ourselves to your tender care and ask you to envelop us, 
no matter where we are, whatever our circumstances today, envelop us into your loving arms in these moments that we have together. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I pray. Amen. Daniel 1.1 says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Verses 1 and 2 give us two views of history. The first view in verse 1 we might call secular history. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. Secular history. So in other words, here's what happened beginning in 605 BC. The Babylonians, in three successive invasions over 20 years, progressively captured the nation of Judah and the city of Jerusalem. They knocked down the walls. They destroyed Solomon's temple. They carried off some of the sacred items associated with the temple. Secular history. Here's what happened. Here's when it happened. Here's where it happened. But verse 2 gives us a very different view. It says, And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. See, secular history, with its emphasis on economics, military power, and philosophical movements, secular history can answer the questions who, what, where, and when. But it takes a different kind of history to answer the why question. Why are things happening the way they're happening? What's going on behind Nebuchadnezzar, the rise of Babylon and the invasion of Jerusalem? You can interpret what's going on in the world right now from a verse one, just the facts, secular history perspective, or from a verse two, sacred history perspective. From a secular history perspective, you could say that what's going on right now in this country is a mounting political battle, an ideological divide in an election year. It's a battle between conservatives, liberals, and progressives. It's a cultural, philosophical battle with little wars breaking out over a wide variety of issues. You can look at life through the lens of politics, economics, sociology, or philosophy. Or you can take a broader view. You can ask God to pull back the curtain of current events to help you see these events through the lens of the greater story of God and his love. St. Augustine wrote that what he called an interpretation of history in a book entitled The City of God. Augustine lived at a time when Rome was sacked by barbarian invaders and many people believed the fall of Rome would lead to the fall of Christianity. But Augustine said, no, What's falling is simply the city of man. It's not the city of God. These two cities have been in conflict since Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. The city of man versus the city of God. We see this conflict throughout history. Jesus said there are two gates, a wide gate that leads to destruction and a narrow gate that leads to eternal life. He said that there are two ways, an easy way headed for hell and a hard way that leads to heaven. Jesus said that there are two masters, money and God, and people have to pick one or the other because they can't serve both. The contrast between the city of man and the city of God grows sharper with the advancing years, and folks are forced to choose sides, to decide what will ultimately rule their lives, what value system, what standard they will live by. Will it be faith or fear, love or or lust, selfishness, or sacrifice? What do you want to control your thinking and your marriage and your family and your dating relationships? What do you want controlling your sexuality and your spending habits? Babylon or Jerusalem? Man's standard or God's? I also want you to notice in verse 2, it says, The Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into Nebuchadnezzar's hands. There's this ongoing conflict between Babylon and Jerusalem, between the city of man and the city of God, between the world and the church, but ruling over it all, sovereign over all, is the Lord. Any temporary defeat, any seeming setback, any ground that seems to be lost or gained 
is under the sovereign oversight of God, the control of God. Guys, God didn't wind up the universe and decide to watch the cosmic battle from the sidelines. God is actively involved. He's holding the reins of history. You don't have to pray, Jesus, take the wheel, because he already has. He has your life, your kids, your marriage, your future, even our local and national governments. He has them in his hands because he has the whole world in his hands. Never forget that. Okay, Daniel, as a young follower of God, is taken captive to Babylon. He and his young friends are ripped away from their families, the only home that they had ever known, and dropped into a place where everyone around them lived by a different standard. It was a new reality for them, filled with danger, uncertainty, and grief over what they'd lost, with new temptations and new worries over what was to come. It was the defining moment, the defining crisis of their lives. And it reveals for us the defining edge, the leading edge of the battle between the city of God and the city of man, between the world's standard and God's. It reveals, among other things, how the world will try to dominate and disciple and assimilate each and every one of us to get us to adopt the world's standards and reject God's standards. I mean, if you were the ruler of the city of man, the ruler of the world, and you wanted to overrun the city of God, the followers of Jesus, and dominate the culture, how would you do it? Well, the first thing you would probably do is target the young, and you would try to convert them to the standards of the city of man. And that's exactly what Nebuchadnezzar did. If you look at verse 4, it says that he chose young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. I'd like to think I would have made the cut, but who knows? Anyway, look at this verse again. He identifies the best and the brightest because they're the future influencers. And what would you do with all of these future influencers if you wanted to take over a culture? Well, you would do a number of things. You would isolate them to begin with. You would isolate them from their families, their traditions, and their support systems. Verse 3, look at this. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring into the king's service some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Basically, what he's saying here is that he separated the cream of the crop from their families, their culture, their home, their traditions, and he transplanted them into the king's palace. Isolation. He took them out of their home country and put them in a completely new place. Now, isolation is a fundamental principle of spiritual warfare. The enemy's design, my friends, is always to cut people off from the encouragement, the fellowship, the church, the support system, I mean, and their families. It's always to cut them off. So I would pay attention, guys. When the government talks about expanding the school year to make school year-round, I would pay attention to the growing number of activities that fill your children's lives so that they spend an increasing amount of time away from your influence. I would pay attention to the specific effects of having a job that forces you to travel and spend long periods of time away from home. I would pay attention if you're getting away from fellowship and away from church and away from your spiritual routines because very, very quickly you will come under the rule and standard of the city of man and you'll start thinking like the world thinks. And of course, Nebuchadnezzar not only isolates these young people, he also indoctrinates them. Verse 4, select young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. Now get this, he was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. Wow, talk about indoctrination. Indoctrination into the language, literature, and thought processes of the Babylonians is what goes on every single day in our media-saturated culture. 
You know this. There is no escape from the language, the literature, and the thought processes of the world apart from God. Every time you turn on a TV or radio, surf the net, look at a billboard, or spend an hour on social media, you're being indoctrinated, discipled, into the prevailing view of the city of man, uh, that God is irrelevant. I mean, every day, whether you know it or not, your worldview is under assault. Identification, isolation, indoctrination. Teach them to think like the world thinks, that God is irrelevant, that all that matters is material wealth, success, or the pursuit of happiness. Indoctrinate them through image after image after image. And then, step four, indulge them. Verse 5, it says, The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. He indulged them. He gave them a taste of the good life. He let them eat from the king's table. Okay, so do you want to hollow out the people of God? Just put some serious dollar signs in front of their faces and wave it around for a while. Give them a taste of the good life and then ask them if they still want to live in the city of God, if they still want to walk the narrow way, if they're drawn to the road less traveled. I mean, the more we indulge ourselves down here, the more we live like the world, the harder it is to follow Jesus, the harder it is to be like Jesus. See, I'm trying to help you see how Satan attempts to assimilate us and draw us off the path. He wants to absorb all of us into the collective that is the city of man. There's a fifth tactic. It has to do with identity. He renamed them. I want you to look at verse 6. It says, Among those who were chosen were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And you say, okay, so what's the big deal about changing their names? It's, it's really not that diabolical. Well, actually, it's simple and yet diabolical. See, the Jews often used names that incorporated a shortened form of the Hebrew word for God, El as in Elohim, or the Hebrew word for Lord, Jah, or Ayah. So we have Daniel. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. For their assimilation to be complete, those names had to be changed to incorporate the names of Babylonian gods. See, in America right now, I know names are just tags. They don't necessarily mean anything. I mean, we go through different periods of having popular names, and then they drift away for a generation or two, and then rise up again. So the names of our grandparents, like Lily, Harry, Rose, and Hazel, all those names are coming back now. But names in general in our culture are just tags. They're, they're fads that pass in and out, not having anything to do with character. But for most of the rest of the world, and throughout most of religious history, names had significance. It identifies you with a particular god. So the Babylonians were creating identity confusion in these young Hebrew men. They, day after day, these young men were called by different names. They were being addressed by the name of a different god, a foreign god, a practice that slowly over time forces you to question your fundamental identity. So what do you do in a crisis? What do you do when you're feeling targeted, isolated, indoctrinated, and indulged? What do you do when what you knew and the people you loved and the faith you grew up with and the things that you could count on, your security and your routine, and who you thought you were have all been stripped away? What do you do in the moment of testing, in the moment of temptation, in your moment of vulnerability? I'll give you three things. Here's the first one. Make a resolution. Make a resolution now. I'm not talking about a New Year's resolution, which may or may not be binding. I'm talking about holy resolve, spirit-empowered resolve. And I get this from verse 8. Look at what it says. But Daniel resolved 
not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Daniel resolved. He made a decision on the front end to live freely and lightly, to walk the road less traveled, to be in the world, but not a product of the world, to live a set-apart life and remain faithful to God despite his circumstances. This resolution a decision made ahead of time, is one of the secrets to remaining faithful to God in a crisis. It's a secret that godly people down through the ages have discovered makes all of the difference when it comes to resisting temptation and pressure when all seems lost. One of the secrets of the spiritual life or life with God is making a decision when you're spiritually strong about what you're going to do in a moment when you're not so strong in a moment of weakness. You don't wait until you're in the throes of temptation when you're being eaten alive by the appetites of of your flesh to figure out the standard by which you will live your life. The strategy of the enemy is always to get you to delay making a decision, to put it off. Every time you feel like you need to make a decision about following Jesus, the enemy will try to get you to procrastinate. One of the secrets of remaining faithful to God is to decide things when the kingdom of God presents itself to you and not put it off. And then, as Ignatius of Loyola recommended, never change that decision. Never change a decision you made in a time of consolation during a time of desolation. In other words, the decision that you made to follow Jesus when you were feeling close to God, keeping company with him, it shouldn't be changed when your circumstances change and you suddenly feel far from God. Never unmake a decision that you made in a time of blessing or consolation in a time when you are hard-pressed. I mean, how does this work out practically in everyday life? Well, before you go on a date, decide what you will and won't allow. Before you make a certain income, resolve now what you're going to do with the money when you make it. Before you get your next paycheck, Make a decision now on how it will be spent, not after the money is burning a hole in your pocket. I mean, whatever tempts you, wherever you are weak, make a decision now regarding that while you're strong, while you're under conviction. I mean, if you put it off, if you wait to decide when you're confronted by temptation, chances are you'll just simply give in. Here's the second thing. What do you do when you're in a crisis? Well, the same thing you would normally do, the things that you've always done. We talked about this. Practice your faith. Keep company with Jesus now more than ever. Daniel not only made a decision ahead of time, he practiced his faith. He he had a daily life with God. I mean, you don't see it necessarily here in Daniel 1, but it shows up again and again and again in virtually every other chapter in the book of Daniel. Daniel is frequently before the Lord. Courage, integrity, and resolve is not something that you just pump up. The courage to keep from imploding under cultural pressure when you're out of sorts in a time of crisis is cultivated, guys, in an abiding love relationship with Jesus. It's the fruit of spending time in God's presence in prayer and meditating on God's word. I mean, the life of Daniel reminds me of that. It reminds me also of something that Emily Griffin wrote in her book, Clinging. She said this, in order to find a person who prays, you have to look for clues, charitableness, good temper, patience, a fair ability to handle stress, resonance, openness to others. What happens to people who pray, she wrote, is that their inward life takes over their outward life. This is not to say that they are any less active. They may be competent lawyers, doctors, executives, but their hearts lie in the inner life and they are moved by that. Daniel was such a one. He was moved by his inner life. He cultivated a secret life with God and it saw him through. I mean, he also depended on God to provide for him even when he had drawn a line, when he had resolved to do something that put him at risk. You know, in in verse 12, Daniel speaks to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over him, and, and he says this, "'Please, 
Test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. You know, the guard reluctantly agreed. And what happened? At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than all the young men who'd been eating the royal food. God took care of them. He provided for them. He honored their faithfulness and their resolve. And he ultimately blessed them. In fact, boy, did he bless them. Verse 17 says, To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. Can you imagine it? He blessed them with gifts and he gave them favor. So let me ask you again, what do you do when all seems lost? Decide now what you will do when you're tempted. Practice your faith. Depend upon God and he will see you through. Let's bow together for prayer. How are you feeling right now? With your head bowed and your eyes closed, how are you feeling right now? Are you frustrated? Are you anxious? Are you unhappy with your circumstances? Are you troubled by old temptations? Or have new temptations arisen as a result of the crisis? As this thing, as this quarantine drags on, are you like so many people getting agitated, looking for someone to blame? Are you, as it says in Colossians 3, shuffling along with your eyes to the ground, preoccupied with what's right in front of you? Or are you keeping your eyes on Jesus? We're going to sing one last song. Why don't you take this opportunity to pray? If you'd like someone to pray with you, you can reach out to us via the Connect card, the VCC app, through chat, or by simply texting PRAY to the number on the screen. We'll follow up, we'll pray with you, and we'll help you on to or along the path as you decide to follow Jesus. Let's worship together, and in a moment, I'll come back and speak a blessing over you. God in my living, there in my breathing, God in my waking, God in my sleeping, God in my resting, God in my speaking, be my everything, be my everything, be my everything, be my everything. God in my hoping, there in my dreaming, God in my watching. God in my waiting, God in my laughing, there in my weeping, God in my hurting, God in my healing, be my everything, be my everything, be my everything, be my in me, Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory, you are everything, Christ in me, Christ in me, Christ in me, the hope of glory, you are everything, be my everything, be my
Jesus everything Jesus everything Jesus everything Jesus everything God in my living air in my breathing God in my waking God in my sleeping There in my working, God in my thinking, God in my speaking, be my everything, be my everything, be my everything, be my everything. I'd like to close our time together with a blessing from Numbers 6, 24 to 26. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Bless you, bless you, bless you. We'll see you soon. Where can I go from your presence? Where can I run from your spirit? You meet me there. Spirit, you meet me there. Before me, your love surrounds.
Rejecting